in the near future, there are going to be millions of people living in space. There are going to be millions of people in rotating habitats where you get 1G, where you can experience things that have not been experienced so far, a whole new realm of human experience. But also, we're going to move industry off Earth as well. Getting off this rock would be one of the, the most important things we could do uh, in terms of very long-term survival uh, of the species. So that's why I got into this. That was, uh, has indeed turned out to be an interesting career. With that big vision of let's get humanity off Earth, I broke it down into small steps. What are the smallest parts? Is there like a minimum viable product that will create the technologies that will get the prices down for the things that we want to do and that will create this exponential change? Slowly, as these things build on each other, we then build up the ability to have permanent jobs in space, uh, permanent facilities, move heavy manufacturing off Earth, uh, start having habitats, exploring, entertainment, content, tourism, uh, just another place to live and, uh, and experience life in a different way. In the last decade, almost 200 satellites worth about $100 billion have had to be destroyed because they've run out of fuel. I have lived with the frustration of having only one tank of gas for far too long. My name's Daniel Faber, and I'm the CEO of OrbitFab. We're building gas stations in space. Do you need a hand or are you good? You know, imagine just trying to get from New York to California by driving and there's no gas stations. It's not gonna happen. And it's the same in space. Like when you don't have that bedrock or that foundation that allows you to reuse your assets and you're stuck in that single use paradigm, you can't really do much. I've worked in the space industry and worked in terrestrial industries. And so I've seen how much is similar, but then also the subtle things that are different that can get you if you don't pay attention. It's hard enough to engineer something to work on Earth, and we've lived here all of our lives. Engineering something to work in space, the amazing thing is we get anything to work at all. That was one, a zero again? Okay, yeah. do one now? Uh, I need to modify the concrete part. So what yeah. we're doing uh, here in the lab now, we've built a table that is perfectly flat piece of granite, and we can float on that two test units and put our docking port there and test how that docks and what's the interaction between them and how the sensors and the algorithms are all working. Because there's no friction on that plane, they'll bounce off and give you a pretty good simulation of what happens in space. Okay, we're floating. Okay, here we go. Frost is fine. All right, we are floating. <laughs> We've tested various components of this system before, but we also haven't really flown it around yet. And so just making sure all the, all the pieces that we have work together at the same time is really what we're trying to get. If an asteroid is made of a protoplanet that's smashed apart, then... Wow, look at that go. Nice! <laughs> Good first test. Electronics in space is a little bit different than electronics on Earth. You have to worry about vacuum and the plasma environment they operate in. But most insidious is a low-level radiation environment. The circuit boards tend to be just a lot more complex. You have a lot of stuff that you're trying to pack into a very small space. I think our current interface board is like a six layer board or something. The flight computer is on like an eight or 10 layer board. Uh, so we're working with complex PCBs. So you have to think very carefully about what's happening inside the chips and make uh, sort of design decisions all the way down to what is the semiconductor technology? Am I PNP or NPN junctions? Do I run CMOS or, or some other technology? So as you work from there, you build not just components that can tolerate that, but systems that can handle uh, small interruptions. And so we build our systems very much thinking about that as a risk management problem holistically. We're using Ultium to help us design those circuits. Uh, one of the advantages, of course, we can, we can simulate things, we can build in rules, so that as we have a knowledge base of circuits that work and good design practices that work, we can then translate those through in a, in a more automated fashion. Uh, that's been really important to helping us to, to make our circuits you know, efficiently and, and quickly and have confidence in them. 
the really interesting thing is we're trying to build these kind of bridges to the future. We have in, in our mind this future where lots of things move around in space and accomplish lots of missions and millions of people live and work there. But we can't go and build that. So we have to trace backwards through the steps that we think are the right steps. And we have to build those steps. Bench test works. So it's kind of a balancing act between looking at long-term paradigms and long-term thinking and really short-term localized thinking and trying to make the best solution for both. You know, I tell people all the time, like what I'm most excited about is not what OrbitFab achieves, but it's what's enabled by there being a unlimited supply of fuel in orbit for people to utilize. The future of humanity is not here. This is a great cradle. But where we will go in the solar system and what we will do long term beyond that, it, it boggles the imagination. Thank you for watching Altium Stories. If you enjoyed what you've seen, please give us a like and share the video, and don't forget to subscribe. We'd love to hear what you think, so please leave a comment in the section below.